Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn quickly to Psalm 46. This is just going to be a quick introductory verse to what we're going to be talking about tonight. Most of y'all probably know this verse by memory, but Psalm chapter 46, verse 10. And uh, we're going to read it. After we read, I'll pray, and then we'll jump right into tonight's spiritual discipline. Psalm 46, 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. How many of y'all know it's hard to be still sometimes? It's hard. This, this life is a busy world. And I don't know if you're like anybody else. There's just so much time you have that is, is dedicated to all these other things. And sometimes it's just hard to be still. Tonight, what I'm going to focus in on is the spiritual discipline of silence and solitude. Now, you might be thinking, how is that a spiritual discipline? Have you tried being silent? Have you tried being still? It's hard, isn't it? It's hard. Uh, listen, we got two ears and one mouth, but somehow we still do, do more talking than we do listening. Uh, and, and so we're going to talk about the discipline of silence and solitude tonight. So if you will, let's pray, and then we'll jump in. My Father, we love you. And we thank you for a night like, not, like tonight where we get to gather together and Lord, we get to be encouraged, we get to be challenged, and Lord, we couldn't do it without you. And so, Father, I'm just asking for your hand to be upon me tonight, Lord, that you would bring to memory all those things I studied for, and Lord, uh, let me just be sensitive to your leading and to your spirit. Help me uh, eliminate the things I don't need to say, but God, help me say the things I do need to say, and God, we're just going to trust you in everything. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> uh, years ago, when I was in seminary, I went to the Baptist College of Florida in the middle of nowhere called Graceville, Florida. Now, has anybody in this place ever heard of Graceville, Florida? Four or five people. Oh, well, yeah, of course. You know, that's, that's my family over there. Of course, they know where Graceville, Florida is. They kind of grew up there for a little bit. Um, Graceville, Florida is kind of in the middle of nowhere. There's some peanut fields, a Hardee's, a Piggly Wiggly, and one of the best Chinese restaurants you'll ever have in your life called Super Canton. Um, but other than that, there was nothing in Graceville, Florida. And I went to uh, this college, and there was this one particular professor at the college. I never took any of his classes, but he was, he was famous at the college. Uh, not because he was a dynamic speaker. It wasn't because he was some rock star professor. It was just because of who he was. He was a genuinely good guy who loved people and loved the Lord. It was evident, man, he, he just had it all over him. His name was Dr. Vaughn. And Dr. Vaughn, he was real unique. He was an older man, and he'd always push a metal cart. And this metal cart would be filled with books. I mean, it's overloaded with books. And he would know, he, he's absolutely read every one of those books. He was a bookworm. And he would know where to reference every, like, if you were talking to him, and like, Dr. Vaughn, what is your view on the Catholic's uh, transubstantiation stance? He's like, well, if the one turn to Daryl Brock's view on page 33, chapter 6, you will find, and like he would just quote it from memory. And it was amazing. And I, and I just remember Dr. Vaughn was just a real genuine sweet guy, but he talked very weird. He would call people the one. If the one would find, if you asked him a question, he'd be like, well, if the one is curious, then you would... And it was like, why do you talk like that? Like, so strange. <laughs> but he was a good, good guy. And many times you would find Dr. Vaughn sitting under a tree at this, this little uh, bench that was put out there. He would sit underneath a tree with his Bible, or he'd be there praying every single day. Every single day you'd find him out there just being alone in the middle of the chaos of being a professor at college, grading papers, reading papers, talking to kids, uh, uh, meeting with parents, d corresponding online, all the crazy. If you're a teacher, you know what that's like. If you're a college professor, it even kind of gets amplified beyond that. He had a busy schedule, but you would always find him alone underneath this tree, just spending time with the Lord. And I remember, I never had a class with him, but one day I saw him across campus, and I made a beeline right to him. <clears throat> and I, I said, Dr. Vaughn, I said, you probably don't know who I am. I said, but uh, I just want to let you know, you have a fantastic reputation here at the college, and people really look up to you. You're a godly man, and you've made an impact in a lot of people's lives. And I just want to say thank you. And he looked at me. He went, oh, Mr. Heptonstall. <laughs> I said, yeah. He said, 
your wife is Tracy, and you have a little girl named Addison. You live in Panama City. Wow. I'm like, all right, this guy's a freak. All right, this guy, how does he know? All, I've never had a class with him. How does he know? But what I found out is he would take the, the student profiles when kids would get registered to the college, and they would have pictures next to their profile, and he would take them home and study them. And he recognized me from my picture from the student profile. And so he's going through the Rolodex of his mind, and he's like, Mr. Heptonstall. Knew my wife's name, my daughter's name, where I lived, everything. And uh, I said, okay. Well, this is my senior year, that, that particular time where we had this conversation. And uh, he says, is there anything I can pray for you about? I said, actually, yeah. We have a church that's approached me, and they're around Daytona Beach, Florida. We don't know if we're going to go or not. Could you pray about some guidance and direction in that decision? He said, absolutely. He pulls out this green little spiral notebook from his pocket, flips it open, turns a few pages, and writes it down. Closes it, puts it back in his pocket. Well, we ended up praying about it, made the decision to move down close to Daytona Beach, took the church. <clears throat> I was associate pastor there for about two and a half years, and some terrible things went down. A lot of financial bad decisions took place. They ended up going bankrupt, and they had to close down the school, close down the preschool. They fired like 16 employees. It was terrible. And uh, the pastor came to me and says, we're going to make some tough decisions. You might want to get out ahead of this thing. So we sold our house, and we moved back to Panama City. And I started putting in security alarms. That's what I've done on and off for about 10 years. I was good at it. And I just happened to have a job close to Graceville, Florida. And so I decided I was going to swing in into campus one day. And I swung in, and guess who I saw sitting underneath the tree out there in front of the campus? Dr. Vaughn. And so I walked up to Dr. Vaughn. I said, Dr. Vaughn, again, this is three years later. I said, I don't know if you remember me. He looks at me and says, ah, Mr. Heptonstall. <laughs> and I said, yes, sir. He says, your wife, Tracy, how is she doing? I said, good. And Addison, very good. Did you have another child, uh, a little boy, Carter? I'm like, okay, that's not on the student profile. I don't know how you figure that one out. But yes, I have a little son named Carter. And he says, well, did you ever get direction about your decision on that church? Wow. This is something I told him to pray about three years ago. I said, yes, sir, I did. He said, great, great. He pulls out his notebook opens it up to that page where he wrote it down and scribbled through it and closed it and put it back in his pocket. Now, this is a long story to illustrate something significant. This man, his life was marked as someone who enjoyed talking to the Lord on behalf of other people. He was somebody who enjoyed sitting alone in the presence of God, who, who, who made sitting and being isolated and silent before the Lord a main priority in every single day of his life. He valued it. He found it of supreme importance that he gets alone with God and he would call out all these names to peop of people that he's met before the Lord. And he was so excited to find out when prayers were answered. And he kept that little green notebook and he would scratch through the names. And I'm thinking this is a phenomenal man, not because he was super intelligent, not because he had a doctorate degree, but because he was just a man of God who lived it. And I'm thinking if we're going to be any people of character, of godly character, then we must have some kind of priority in our life where we value the discipline of getting alone with God and spending some quality time with Him. And I'm, I'm sorry to say it is hard in our culture today to just be quiet, <clears throat> to just get alone. See, in, in your handout, I have a definition of silence. Silence is the voluntary and temporary abstention from speaking so that certain spiritual goals may be sought. Sometimes silence can be found when you're reading, when you're journaling, when you're writing, but it's just a time where you're intentionally silent. Solitude is, is a spiritual discipline of removing yourself, withdrawing yourself temporarily for a private spiritual purpose. So you're removing yourself from, a, from that noisy environment, from the chaos, and you're, you're taking a few days or maybe a few moments to just get alone with God at a different location. That you're, you're entering into a place of solitude. You need solitude. You need fellowship. It's good that we fellowship. I'm not telling everybody here that you need to be monks and you go live off the grid and you become a hermit and you just, go all, you just live by yourself. And that's not what I'm saying. Because over 50 times in the New Testament, we see the phrase, one another, one another. You need to encourage one another, exhort one another, edify one another, pray for one another. Over 50 times in the New Testament, one another is important. But just as important it is to fellowship, it's important that we have time where we're just alone. And that we have isolation. We have a, a, a time that we separate for the... Because here's the thing. If you never get alone, then you just stay shallow. 
there's certain things that you learn when you're alone with God that helps you go deeper. And if you never have fellowship, then you become stagnant. There's certain energy and excitement that happens when you're around other believers, isn't it? And so when you isolate yourself from a believer, you become stagnant. But if you isolate yourself from getting alone with God, you become shallow. And so we need both. And, and for some of you, you might call this time of silence and solitude as your quiet time. Now, you know, y'all know what I'm saying when I say quiet time. It's a time that you devote every single day to just get alone with God. You get your Bible, maybe a devotional book, and you, you just get down and you just maybe wake up before everybody else. And you get alone time with God before the house gets crazy. Maybe you're a stay-at-home mama. And you're a stay-at-home mama, and you got to drop off all the kids, make sure everybody's fed, make sure everybody's awake, and everybody's dressed, and you get everybody dropped off. You come home, and you have just a few minutes before the chaos begins again. And so you just settle down, and you have a little silence and solitude right then with the Father. Listen, whatever it is, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. But just put yourself in the shoes of your grandparents or great-grandparents. All right, some of y'all know what I'm talking about when I say this was a time before electronics. It would have been easy for grandpa or great grandpa to go out to the yard and the only noise he would have heard was God's creation and the noise he made. Whether it's a shovel on the ground, whether it's the feed he's throwing out, whether it's him just walking through the grass, it's all the noise he heard. There wasn't helicopters and airplanes flying around. There wasn't the noise from the streets of busy cars going back and forth. There wasn't that obnoxious neighbor playing ACDC in their garage super loud. Like it was just quiet. And then grandma, or great grandma, is in the kitchen or in the house and she's doing her items and, and there was no hum of the refrigerator, there was no hum of the AC, there was no TV or radio going on in the background. The only thing she heard was the noise she was making and the noise of God's creation. In that culture, it provided them ample amount of time to be quiet and to be still before the Lord. But two generations later, where we are today, we are never anywhere without sound. I mean, we have noise everywhere. And the problem here in America is that we have been conditioned to be comfortable with noise. You get home, and the first thing you do is you sit down, you pull out your phone, you turn on the TV, and you start scrolling. Not paying attention to what's on TV, but you start scrolling. And maybe your kid comes in there and changes the channel, you fuss at him, hey, I was watching that. You weren't watching that. You were on your phone. But you just like the noise of the background, what's going on. Maybe the first thing you do when you get in your car, the first thing you do is turn on the radio. If you go to the gym and work out, you put in your headphones, listen to music. My kids, each one of my kids has a noise maker in their room at nighttime that plays rain sounds. And it's just noise in the background. For every day of their life, they have, it has rained every night. <laughs> in their reality, it has rained every single night of their life. But we have become comfortable with noise, and, and I don't think it's very good for us to be comfortable with noise. Matter of fact, five times in the gospel, it talks about how Jesus got away from the crowds. Five times it says Jesus got alone with God. And Jesus is our example, right? That's who we're trying to be like. And so what I'm going to do tonight, tonight I'm going to give us some reasons why we need the spiritual discipline of silence and solitude. And then towards the end, I'm going to give you some practices on how you can do it in your own life. All right. So number one, why do we need the, the discipline of silence and solitude? Number one, so we can follow Jesus' example. To follow Jesus' example. The scripture teaches time and time again, Jesus practiced silence and solitude. In Romans, it says that we are to be conformed to the image of his son. Who is God's son? Jesus. All right. So our mission in life is to become like Jesus. In other words, we have to imitate what he did. We read the scriptures. He was somebody who practiced silence and solitude. Therefore, to be like Jesus, we got to do what he did. Let me give you some references. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Then was Jesus led up the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. In other words, there was a time where he was led by the Spirit to be alone for 40 days. This is a priority. Before his earthly ministry began, one of the things the Spirit led him to do was be alone, to find silence and solitude. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 23, And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, look what he says, he was there alone. 
So he sends the multitudes away. There's people coming, swarming him, but he made it a priority to send them people away so he could find time to be alone with the Father. Look in Mark chapter 1, verse 35. And in the morning, rising up great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. So in the, in the verse we previously read from Matthew, it says he went at the evening time, sent everyone, everyone away at evening to find time to pray. In Mark's gospel, it says before everyone is awake, he got up before the daylight and went out to pray. In other words, twice a day, Jesus would find time to be alone with the Lord. Here, here, here's what we have, alone with God. Here's what we have to see is that if Jesus needed it, how much more do we need it? Jesus sent away the multitudes. Now, imagine being in his position. You are the one that has the power to fix every issue. And the word is getting out. And so people are bringing their, their sick and their lame and their paralyzed and their demon possessed and all these people to Jesus because he's the only one that can do what he can do. Right. Now, I don't know about you, but I would feel a little guilty sending those people away. I, don't, I mean, that's just me. I don't know. But Jesus understood my personal time with God is greater than my ministry. My personal time with the Father is more important than my job. My personal time with the Father is more important than anything this world feels is important. And I think there's a valuable lesson to learn there because sometimes we make excuses why we don't have enough free time. Because we're too busy. We got too much work. We got too many jobs. We got too many chores. We got too many kids. We got too many whatever. Yet, I don't know about you, but is anybody in here more, be more busy than Jesus was? Anybody in here got the excuse that, hey, my, my life's a little bit more busy than Jesus was. Yet he found time twice a day to get alone with the Father. So we look at his example. We look at his example. Um, number two, another reason why we should practice spiritual discipline in our life is to hear God's voice better. To hear God's voice better. One of the most obvious reasons to get away from the noise is so that we're able to hear the voice from heaven better. Sometimes we get so bombarded with noise and busyness that we just can't just tune it out and focus. And there's some excellent examples. As a matter of fact, there's a time where Elijah goes on this, this journey at Mount Horeb and he fasts for 40 days. He's alone and isolated on Mount Horeb during this time. And look what, look what happens in 1 Kings chapter 19. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11, it says, And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? Sometimes we need to get alone so we can just hear that still, small voice. That gentle whisper. That, 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 that gentle guidance in our life. There's another part where Habakkuk, Habakkuk goes and he stands at the guard post on a tower so he can be there alone. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1, it says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am, when I am approved. So there's a time when Habakkuk was basically doing this. He's like, I'm going to put my, myself in a position. I'm going to put myself in a place where I'm alone without distractions because I need to know what God's wanting to do here. I don't want distractions. I don't want any other noise. I'm going to go somewhere where it can just be me and God. I'm going to wait for him to tell me what to do next. So a lot of times the purpose of getting alone in silence and solitude is so we can understand and hear the voice of God in a better way. It's a place away from distractions. Now, here's the thing. It's not that God can't speak to us when there's noise. All right? It's not like God's voice is, is so sensitive that he can't get to us when it's noisy. Because let's be honest, how many times has God spoken to you in the middle of a Sunday service surrounded by a thousand people? 
All right, that God, God has spoken to me many times in a, in a crowded room, and God has spoken many times in the middle of chaos. It's not that God doesn't speak in noisy places, but it positions ourselves better to hear His voice when there's no distractions, there's no noise, it's just us and Him. He can speak in a, in a room full of crowded people, but that's not, that's not always the case. Sometimes He just wants you to get alone. There, there's a great preacher and revivalist named Jonathan Edwards. He preached a message called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And he preached that message and revival struck and spread everywhere. Now, he tells about when he was courting his fiance. She was a teenager. And he, he writes a little snippet about her. And this is what he says. She hardly cares for anything except to meditate on him. She loves to be alone walking in the fields and groves and seems to have someone invisible always talking with her. In other words, he's speaking about his little teenage future bride and says, I just watch her from a distance, and she just, it's like she's out there just talking to God every day in the fields and the groves. Now, here's what I want to encourage you with. You need to go find your own fields and groves. Now, it might be a park. It might be a long walk around the block. It might be somewhere, but another place away from distraction, away to, to put us in a place of withdrawals. Because let's be honest, we're addicted to noise. And the moment the noise stops, we get weird. So I've been preparing for this message. And I'm like, okay, if I'm going to tell them to do something, I'm going to do it first. So I've been trying to stop with the noise. And it's weird. <laughs> My first thing, I want to get in the car and turn, off the, turn on the radio. And I'm like, oh, okay, no radio today, no radio. Uh, uh, okay, uh, I'm going to, and there's these little adjustments I'm trying to make where I just kill the, the noise. And I've realized how addicted I am to noise. It's tough. And so we have to be intentional. We have to get alone. One of the first things we do when we get in our house is turn on the TV. There's nothing wrong with TV, but if you're watching TV from the moment you wake up to the moment you fall asleep, there's no silence. There's no quiet time. Uh, I used to listen to music all the time when I did my Bible study. Then I realized it, help, it actually distracts me more than, more than it helps me. That's not always the case for everyone. Pastor Malcolm gets down with some music in his worship, in his, in his uh, personal time. Today, he was shaking the walls with some kind of music this morning in the office while he was doing his quiet time. That works for him. Doesn't work for me. All right, so uh, I, some of you might like worship music while you're doing your quiet time, but I can't. How many of you would say you have a difficult, out there at Fairview, how many of you say you have a difficult time falling asleep at night sometimes because your mind just starts racing? You start thinking about all the things you need to do. You start thinking about a checklist of stuff you need to get done. Maybe you start thinking about the embarrassing thing that happened to you in his third grade. All right, it's like these random things that pop in your mind. Or, Or how many of you would admit that sometimes you get some of your best thinking done when you're in the shower? Anybody ever said that? Yes, I, I, I guess I'm the only one. All right, so whatever. I've written entire sermons in the shower before. All right, Trace is like, there's no hot water. I'm like, yeah, but I got a message out of it. Um, but why does that happen? Why does our mind race at bedtime? Why does our thinking get clear in the shower? Because one of the, that's one of the first times in the entire day there's no noise. It's quiet. And now your brain begins to process and begins to think and turn and churn. And and all of a sudden your mind gets to racing. Imagine what God would be able to do in your mind and your thoughts and your spirit and your soul if there was no noise. Imagine how he could captivate every part of your mind when there's no distractions. That's what he's wanting. That's what he's wanting. Number three, to express worship to God, to express worship to God. Do you know worship doesn't always require words and sounds and actions? Do you know it's possible to have wordless worship? Sounds weird, but possible. Matter of fact, what does Psalm 4610 say? It says, be still. And know that I'm God. All right, that, that's a form of worship, being still, acknowledge that He is God. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 20. It says, But the Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep what? Silence, Silence before Him. Ooh. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 7. Hold thy peace. You know what He's saying? Shh. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God. 
So it's just not just being silent, it's having silence with a purpose. It's being silent for a reason, and that is to be in his presence and get before him and say, okay, God, I'm, I'm disconnected. I'm not distracted. I'm in your presence. Go. I'm silent. What, what do you want to talk to me about? Just, just tell me. What do you want to tell me? I remember this one time I was at this revival when I was a teenager, and uh, we were kind of Baptocostal. Some of y'all don't know what it means. It means we're a little bit Baptist, sometimes a lot of it Pentecostal, all right? Just, it goes back and forth. But we was, we was really Baptocostal at this one church, and, and this, we had this group coming up there to sing, and, and we had the preacher up on the front row up here, and, 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 and Brother Jimmy Oliver, he's one of our members at that church, he would get the clapping and go, Amen! And he'd holler and scare you to death. He'd come out of nowhere. And then, and then Brother Willie Pollard, he'd get up and make laps in a sanctuary. He was more Pentecostal than Baptist, but we loved him. And so he would get up and just start tracking around the auditorium. And Jimmy Oliver's clapping, and, and there's people amen and getting down with it. People crying down at the altar. Man, it was, it was good. And then you look at the revival preacher. He's not moving. He ain't budging. He's sitting there, head bent over, not even phased. And I remember one, I was sitting right behind him. I remember this guy come over there to the preacher. He says, what's wrong with you, preacher? Your wood wet? <laughs> and the preacher, without even looking up, said, if I was to join you where you are, I would have to step down from where I'm at. And what he was saying was in that moment, he was so enjoying the presence of God that he didn't have to get up and run around and act crazy and slap his hands and shout. And he, just, he was just sitting there just marinating in it. And he says, if I was to join you, I'd have to step down from where I'm at. And he wasn't being arrogant. He wasn't being prideful. He's being real. He was enjoying worshiping God in silence. In silence. Don't ever judge the way somebody else worships. Don't ever judge how somebody else worships. And he just sat there and enjoyed simply sitting and being wrapped in the presence of God to a point that he couldn't speak. So there is always a place for wordless worship. Number four, to express faith in God. One of the reasons we do this is to express faith in God. If we're honest, many times when we come to a place of prayer, we're pretty frantic. We're making all these requests. God, I need you to do this. God, please do this. God, please help me here. God, please touch this person there. Please, God, God. And we're making request after request after request. And very seldom do we ever just sit there and get quiet and just wait and just trust. We do a lot of talking and very, very little listening. And, and, and praying and talking and making requests Sometimes uh, it gets a little old because God has so much he wants to say and we're not giving him a chance to say it. David writes about this in Psalm 62. Psalm 62, verse 1 and 2, he says, Truly my soul waiteth. That word waiteth is the Hebrew word dumiah, which means to sit in silence. So truly my soul sits in silence upon God. From him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. Then again, in Psalm 62, verse 5 through 6, he says, My soul, wait. In other words, sits in silence. Thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Isaiah 30, 15. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning in rest shall you be saved. Look, look at this. In what? Quietness and in confidence shall you be your strength, and you would not. In other words, there's times where it's okay to not have to say a thing, and you're just before God silently in faith and trust, and you're just kind of dumbfounded on what to say, but you're just coming to Him anyways because you have full faith, knowing that He can still minister to your needs. Matter of fact, the Holy Spirit says that He will pray on our behalf when we don't know what to say. You don't have to talk. You can just be in his presence and enjoy his presence and say, God, I don't know, but you do. I don't know, but I do know this. You can. And so I'm just going to sit here and I'm just going to enjoy your presence because I don't know what to say. Listen, there are times where it's okay to express faith by not saying a thing. <clears throat> to approach him in silence and quietness. 
There was a time last year during Tracy's diagnosis. I know I talk a lot about this, but I'm going to be honest. That, that, that whole episode last year has forever been a landmark of extreme faith in our life. Like we saw God move in marvelous, magnificent ways. And so I'll probably talk about it for the rest of my life. Because although I, I hated that we went through it, I'm thankful we did. Because it grew us in, in, in incredible ways. But there was a time, probably a week or two in her diagnosis, where I was just crushed. And I went to my dining room table, and I opened up my Bible, and I was home alone. The kids were at school. Tracy was at the hospital. And I pulled out my Bible, and I opened up to Psalm chapter 91, and I began to read. In verse 1, it says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust Surely he shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. And I read verse 5. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. And I stopped there, and I read it again. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. And I just... Like, God, there's something you're wanting to say to me here. What is it? Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. And I kept reading it over and over again. And I was just silently there talking to God. I said, God, what are you trying to tell me here? He says, Andrew, those terrors by night are those things you can't see coming. They're the things that go bump in the night. You know what I'm saying? Like, the things you don't know. Andrew, we don't, you don't know what's going to happen in the next few weeks or even the next few months. And you don't know what your finances will be after this. And you don't know how the long-term effects of this will be on Tracy's health. You don't know a lot of things that are coming. And he says, in the arrow that flieth by day, he says, those are those things you do see coming. Those are those things like the diagnosis when they told her you have, you have AML. The things you see like her hair falling out on her pillow. Uh, the, the, the things you saw, like when you told your children on that Saturday that, your mom, that their mama has cancer. Like those are the things you see. And in that moment, at my dining room table, God began to speak to me. He says, here's what I'm trying to tell you, Andrew. You don't have to worry about the things you don't see coming. And you don't have to worry about the things you do see coming. Because I am your shield. And I'm your refuge, and I will deliver you, and I will protect you, and I'm your fortress. And in that moment, in silent worship and in silent faith, tears began to drop from my eyes because I was sitting there in the presence of God as he, as he began to preach the Word of God over my life and began to confirm some things in my heart and in my life. I didn't have to say a thing. I just sat there and cried in full faith, believing that God was going to do what He said He was going to do. In that moment, God dropped something in my heart I didn't share with a lot of people, and I wish I would have. But in that moment, God spoke to me and said, Andrew, she's going to be okay. And I just kind of like Mary when the shepherds came and said all these things about Jesus and said she kind of pondered these things in her heart. That's kind of what I did. I heard heard him say, she's going to be okay, and I just kind of pondered that in my heart. And when the doctors would come in and they would make these bold claims and these unpredictable outcomes and they would say all these things about her lab work and her scans and these things weren't right, I just pondered that truth in my heart that God said, it's going to be okay. And I didn't have to freak out. I didn't have to worry. I didn't have to go and, and begin to wonder. No, God spoke it to me. And so in quiet faith, I just believed it. And I just stood on that faith and stood on that claim that God said it, so it's going to happen. And so through it all, Guess what? She's in remission. She's good. God has touched her. Like, okay, we're fine. There is something so important because I would have missed out on that promise. I would have missed out on, that, on God ministering to me in that moment if I didn't take seriously the time of being silent in solitude in Him, with Him. If I, if I just neglected that time, I would have missed out on that. There is so much value in being silent before God and finding time to get away from everything so you can get with Him. And so I don't want you to miss out. 
So how can you apply this to your life? Let me give you some practical things on how you can apply this. Number one, improve the moment. Improve the moment. In parentheses, I I have one-minute retreats. But improve the moment. We have opportunities almost every single day. Think about it this way. Let me give you some practical ways. Think about it this way. You're driving down the road. You come to a traffic light. And right before you get to that traffic light, it turns red. You stop. And if you're like me, you get frustrated. And you start saying things, I'm getting stuck at every stinking light. I every stinking one of them's turning red. And I get frustrated. Now, does me being angry and frustrated make that light change colors any quicker? No, it feels good, but it don't make it help, right? That light, if it's a 90-second light or a two-minute light, that light's going to stay red that amount of time before it turns green again. Now, here's how you can improve the moment. You now have a 90-second to a two-minute retreat with God. And so instead of pulling out your phone and start playing on your phone, here's what you do. You turn off the radio, and for 90 seconds or two minutes, you just spend time with the Lord. You start praying about where you're going. Maybe you're going on a doctor visit. Maybe you're going to school. Maybe you're going to work. Maybe you're going to Walmart. Lord knows you need prayer for that. Yes. And you start praying, talking to the Lord. Hey, you go through drive through The line ain't moving. Now, you can sit there and be angry about the line moving, but is it going to make it move any quicker? No. 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 So what do you do? You improve the moment. Here's an opportunity. You have a two-minute, five-minute retreat with the Lord sitting in drive through at McDonald's waiting to get your order taken. And you can just talk to the Lord. Yeah. You get to the window. They say, sir, we are so sorry, but we got to drop some new nuggets. It's going to take five minutes for the chicken nuggets to cook. And now you can get mad and cuss out that 15-year-old kid behind the cash register. Or you can improve the moment and just say, well, here's a five-minute opportunity for me to spend with the Lord. All right. And so we just pull forward and we have a little time with the Lord. You see what I'm saying? There's opportunities every day. You go to the school pickup line, being mad at that soccer mom that pulled out in front of you before you got there is not going to make that line move any quicker, but you can improve the moment. It's an opportunity. All right. How about this? Set a goal. Set a goal of silence and solitude. Again, this could be considered your your daily quiet time. Your goal should be every day. Set a goal of silence and solitude. It should be more than just those intersections that you have, those little moments. It should be bigger than that. Here's the thing. I've been in church in some capacity since I was five years old. I've served on staff in some capacity for 18 years. I've been preaching for over 20 years. I've been in church for a, a, a hot minute. And no one in my church background who I consider holy or godly neglected this. Every single person I would consider a godly person had a personal daily quiet time with the Lord. You cannot be a godly person apart from having spiritual time set apart for you and the Lord. It's not possible. Name one person you consider godly. And then ask yourself, do they have a personal time with the Lord? Guarantee they do. Guarantee. If you want to see growth in your Christian walk, then set a time aside so that you can have time with the Lord. Now, now we know this. You've been told this how many times? How many of y'all know you should have a quiet time with the Lord every single day? All right. We know this. It's like being told you need to eat healthy. How many of you have been told you need to eat healthier? All right. How many of y'all do it? All right. See what I'm saying? You see? We know. We know. We've been told the right things to do. We know what we should do. The hard thing's doing it, right? That's why it's called discipline. And so set a goal. Set a time. I I say it this way. Find a spot and a slot. Find a spot somewhere you want to have your quiet time and find a slot in the day that you want to have it. It might be five in the morning. It might be five at night. It might be during your lunch break, but whatever it might be. There is no such thing as a hero of faith or an incredible man or woman of God who has ever accomplished that level without spending alone time with God. Number three, try and get away. Try and get away. What I mean by this is uh, a few years ago, I wish I could do it more often, but a few years ago I grabbed my tent and I drove out to the woods and I went tent camping by myself. Now, this, don't think I'm some kind of like bad mama jamming. Like, no, I packed way more food than it was necessary for a one night, okay? <laughs> I would have survived on... Twinkies and, and uh, Pop-Tarts for about three weeks. I would have been fine. 
Um, I, I'm not Bear grills. I don't live all, I'm not going to, you know, grab squirrels and eat them raw. I'm not going to, I come prepared. But I came to the tent and in the woods for a purpose. I wanted to have just quiet time with God. And so I separated myself from all the distractions. I got alone time with God. I went camping. Tent camping, I put, up my, uh, I put up my hammock, I sat in the hammock, I sat in, the, in, in, in my chair, I went hiking, I took my Bible and read it. It was marvelous. Yeah. It was so awesome. Amen. There is a time that you should find some time in your life within the year that you just get away. Yeah. Now it could be just for a day. It could be just for an extended afternoon. But find somewhere to go. I had a friend of mine that put a stump out in the woods. And he would go sit on that stump for hours just to be alone with God. It was just, it was a stump. But for him, it had a purpose. Sometimes people will come to the church. They feel like if they come to the church, they'll be in a better mindset to spend some time and alone time with God. Uh, I, I think that's a marvelous idea. We've had people do it here. I think that's great. I think, I think there's a, a benefit to changing your environment. Let me give you an example. I bought a weight. I go to the gym pretty regular, but I bought a weight set to keep at my house because I thought I was going to start working out at the house. You know how many times I use that weight set at the house? Goose egg. All right, zero times. But if I get up in the morning, set an alarm, and I have my gym clothes laid out, and I put on my gym clothes, and I drink my pre-workout, and I drive 12, 13 minutes to get to the gym, and I get to the gym, you know what I'm going to do? Work out. Work out. That's right. Because I'm at the environment. I've made the mindset to do it. I'm going to get myself in that gym and work out. This is why it's important sometimes that we try and get away. Because we might say, well, I'm going to do it one day. I'm going to do it one day. But if you say, no, tomorrow I'm going to get up. I'm going to drive down to the park. I'm going to find me a place to sit. I'm going to have me some alone time with God. And then tomorrow you get up and you drive to the park. You know what you're probably going to do? Have some alone time with God. Because you put yourself in that mindset and that environment that you're going to discipline yourself to do it. So every now and then it's good to kind of shift things up and get out of your element, get into a new environment. There's a church, uh, I wish we could do it here, but we can't. But there's a church uh, in one of my hometowns that uh, every Thursday from 10 to 12, they would offer a ministry to, to stay-at-home moms. And they would watch the children from 10 to 12 to stay-at-home moms who come to the church and have alone time that's quiet and away from all the distractions where they could just be alone with God. Like, that's a great ministry. Now, the reason I say we can't do it here at Temple is because we have a preschool and there's all kinds of babies and stuff out there. and We're at capacity and we just can't take no more children. All right, so well, we can't do it here, but I think it's a great ministry. Now, you might be hearing me and you think, Brother Andrew, you don't know how bad I want to have some quiet time. You don't know how bad I wish I could have some solitude. The only silence and solitude I get is when I go to the bathroom and I lock the door and the minions are on the other side saying, Mama, Mama. And my husband's screaming, Honey, where's my keys? And you don't know how bad I want some silence and solitude. You don't understand. Well, here's how you'd handle this. You find a buddy. You find a buddy. So for your mamas in this room who have kids, and you're like, I can't handle it. I don't have no silence and solitude. I don't know what that is. You find a buddy. You find another mama. And you do a trade-off system. One time a week, you watch their kids from 10 to 11 or 10 to 12. Let them have some alone time with the Lord. Yep. Eat some lunch. Then you swap. Now from 12 to 1 or, or, or from 12 to 2, they watch the kids and you have alone time with the Lord. Yep. If there is a will, there is a way. You'll find a way. You'll find a way. Find a partner. Find a buddy. Hey, if you're married, your husband could probably keep that baby alive for about an hour. All right? If you just say, honey, I need some quiet time. Can you watch the child? All right? Husbands, step up. All right? Let them get alone every now and then. It's okay if they go to Target. All right? Because really, they're just trying to get away. All right? They need some silence and solitude. But let's use silence and solitude for a purpose. Now, these are just some silly but very practical ways that we can have silence and solitude. And, and I hope you see the significance in it. Because God is going to say some things in your private times that he may not say to you in your public times. And if Jesus needed to get alone, how much more do we need to get alone? 
Imagine what God would say to you with an uncluttered mind, without distractions, just peace. Maybe some of my men in here, instead of going fishing on a Saturday, you leave the fishing poles at home. I know that sounds like sacrilegious, <laughs> but you leave the fishing poles at home and you go out in the water just for the simple purpose of being alone and being quiet. What would happen if you spent two or three hours on Smith Lake or Katoma or Gunnersville, and it's just you and the Lord out there in nature? Maybe you need to load up the car one day, Mama, or single lady, or Grandma, and you just go somewhere, you drive somewhere. We have beautiful scenery here in Alabama. And you go and just park the car somewhere, and you just sit there and just watch the sunset, spending alone time with the Lord. Let Him speak to you. Let him encourage you. Let him ease your thoughts and your mind. I promise you. I promise you. If you position yourself in a way where you allow God to speak to you, he will. He will. Every time. Now, I'm going to do something. It's going to be strange to a lot of you. We're going to do out there a fair view, too. You're going to participate, too, fair view. Here's what we're going to do. For the next few minutes, we're going to dim the lights. Don't go to sleep on me. All right, don't go to sleep. Some of y'all already got heavy eyelids. Don't go to sleep on me. We're going to put your phone away. You're going to avoid the temptation to get up and leave or go to the bathroom. Now, I just said that. Now, some of y'all are like, I just got to go to the bathroom now all of a sudden. I didn't have to before, but now you said I can't. Now I have to. All right, but we're going to avoid the temptation of getting up to go to the bathroom. We're not going to talk to our neighbors. And just for about the next few minutes, out there at Fairview, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to dim the lights. We're going to play just some ambient music with some nature sounds. I know this sounds weird, but you're going to find something interesting. Here's one of two things you're going to find. Number one, some of you are going to think that it's going to last for eternity. It's going to be grueling for you to sit still and be in here doing nothing for a few minutes. You're going to think, is this ever going to stop? Then the others, when it does stop, you're going to think, couldn't we go longer? Because this might be for the first time all day, maybe in weeks, that you intentionally just sat still. And what I'm going to encourage you to do is during this time, whatever position you want to take, you can just sit there in your chair, you can come down to the altar, you can turn around and use your chair as an altar, you can just sit there, I don't, I don't care, whatever you want to do. And we're going to take this opportunity for the next few minutes to just talk to the Lord. Spend some time in his presence. I know it's going to be weird for some of you, but I promise you it's going to be great. It's going to be great. So let's do that right now. Thank you. 
can't think of a greater gift than the God of the universe wanting to have time with me. Father, you know me better than I know myself. You know the hair that is on, how many hairs I have on my head. Your word tells me your thoughts towards me are greater than the number of sands on the beaches. And God, to know that you love me so much that you want to have quality time with me, and yet there's been so many times in my own life where I've neglected to do that. God, I pray that this church here and at, at Fairview would make it a high priority to set a time aside every day to just be with you. Cancel out the noise, cancel out the distractions, to realize there is nothing more important than that. No excuse we can come up with is greater than what we get to experience with you. Father, I pray you would motivate us, encourage us, help us be disciplined enough to just sit alone with you. 